Welcome to Startup Health Now, the weekly webcast that celebrates the healthcare transformers and change makers reimagining healthcare. My name is Unity Stokes, and today we're here at the Wearable Tech and Digital Health Conference in New York City. We've got a special guest, Dr. Ruzba Ghaffari, who is the co-founder and VP of technology of a very cool company, MC10. We're going to be talking all about the wearable space, uh, lots of innovations and lessons learned for other innovators and entrepreneurs. Stick around, it's going to be a great show. It is the duty of leaders to lead, of the creative to create, of the daring to do. The free world expects leadership of us. Its fate and our fate depends upon our leadership. We are industrious, inventive, restless, with the fires that burn within us. Well, I say that nothing is easy, and the best things are the hardest. And all our troubles, all our immense difficulties, now and in the future, can I say, be solved if we have the will, the courage. The future is to, future those, who to take those who take it. Welcome back to Startup Health Now. We're with Dr. Ruzbe Ghaffari. Uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, you're the co-founder of MC10, one of the most interesting uh, technology companies around. Um, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So just to start off, I'd love to learn about you. Um, how did you get involved um, in, in, in doing what you're doing, maybe just a leading up to before MC10? Mm -hmm. So I um, did a lot of my uh, uh, studies in the Boston area at MIT. I was always uh, drawn to engineering growing up as a child. My parents were both uh, very much into the science, mathematics, and um, engineering. So grew up that way, went to MIT, uh, did a lot of uh, my work in at the interface of engineering and biology, which is uh, essentially where I did my graduate work. Uh, really, uh, a few turns towards the end of graduate school put me in the right sort of circles of people uh, in the Boston entrepreneurial community that, that's uh, growing there. Wait, um, what year was this? This is 2007-2008 uh, timeframe. Um, I ended up uh, crossing paths with a few folks uh, uh, who were investors as well as entrepreneurs in the in the local Boston area. Uh, Carmichael Roberts, who's a, a venture capitalist, who's also done a number of uh, biotech and um, different startups in, in the area. Um, met him through uh, just uh, a class that I took uh, cross-registered at Harvard Business School towards the end of graduate school. Um, and really, he um, acted my, as my mentor, introduced me to a few uh, Harvard professors, uh, uh, world-renowned Professor George Whitesides. Um, he uh, and I and a few other folks uh, helped spin out a, a nonprofit called Diagnostics for All, um, which was a microfluidics health diagnostics platform. That really, that experience kind of gelled, uh, you know, my future up until now, uh, essentially, um, in the sense that um, it was a startup, so I definitely chose uh, a path to go down startup companies as opposed to big companies. Um, and it really introduced me to the right people. So Professor John Rogers was a postdoc in, in the Whitesides lab back in the 90s. I met him and that was essentially the beginnings of MC10 back in 2008-2009. Wow. W was there an aha moment for you maybe when you were still in school or it could have been much earlier where you knew that you didn't just want to be an engineer, but you wanted to also be an entrepreneur? Uh, so being in that Cambridge, Boston community, you're always b bombarded by um, the next company that's coming out of Harvard, MIT. So there's the MIT 100K competition, which is a business plan competition that's happening every year. Uh, Harvard Business School has a competition. So you're just, even as an undergrad, you're kind of drawn to it just to see what it's all about. And for me, that happened uh, pretty early on in you know sophomore year of college, just getting a sense of what this whole ecosystem is all about. And I don't think there are many places in the world like that. I mean, it's become a lot more popular, but 10, 15 years ago, there was the Bay Area and the East Coast and Boston mainly where this sort of um, environment was promoted and there's competitions and things. And so that uh, was something I became drawn to early on. And then in graduate school, um, 
started to meet the right people who were also, um, you know, very much vested in that community and um, just kept my eyes open for the right opportunities to meet the right people. How, how did you go about doing that? How did you meet the right people? Were, were there meetups? Are there special classes that you took? Is it networking through friends? What, what were the things that, that you did that maybe others could model, uh, you know, their future path mm-hmm. on? So part of it was my background was at this intersection of bioengineering and um, microfluidics and engineering, um, building nanoscale systems. So um, at the time, there's you know a lot of uh, faculty in the Harvard MIT community who um, do research as well as spin out companies in this area. So um, I was just drawn to those few uh, members of the MIT and Harvard faculty who were doing that. And um, it really was a, a mixture of seeking them out and then being in the right kind of environment. So um, taking classes at Harvard Business School laid the foundation for that. It wasn't the be all end all by, by any means because you still have to control the interpersonal um, relationships that, that grow out of these sort of meetings and, and courses. Um, and I was very fortunate that I um, met a lot of uh, key entrepreneurs who, um, and the timing was just right. I was just finishing up school. Uh, and one thing led to another through conversations. And, um, you know, MC10's uh, roots tie back to, you know, me being able to meet with Professor John Rogers, who, um, you know, all of this technology grew out of his lab. So the fact that I had the background to um, kind of communicate with him and be able to, um, not only just understand what he's doing, but add a, a layer of, um, uh, of of interest and understanding on top in biomedicine kind of made it a very nice uh, synergy. Uh, he comes from a much more material science background. I brought in more of the biomedical, and we were able to kind of see it uh, in between, which helped launch MC10. Let's, let's dig into the genesis there. Um, uh, first of all, for the audience, what is MC10? What's the mission and vision behind it? So MC10, uh, again, founded in late 2008. Uh, it's a spin-out out of University of Illinois, Professor John Rogers' lab. Um, main foundational technology was around flexible and conformal electronics. Um, there's a wide variety of different places you can apply this sort of technology. We found out the hard way that uh, you know, there's industry applications and uh, building um, jet engines that have sensors integrated in that are flexible. That sounded interesting, but really the... the, the you had to focus in at some point. We, we had to focus in, and we also had to find the best suitable applications. And those happen to be in the biomedical space for us. Um, it took us a little while to navigate, and um, it took the market to kind of uh, catch up with the few things that we were exploring back in 2008, 2009. Uh, But right around 2011, uh, this concept of going from a flexible, stretchable, conformal circuit or electronics to something you put on the body, it became um, a little bit more aligned with the way the world was going. We started to see... It didn't seem so sci-fi at that point. Exactly. People could say, hey, you know, a Band-Aid. I could see how this would work in a Band-Aid. Right. And and that we really needed that sort of buy-in from the community that, you know, it's not just a sci-fi cyborg type of device. It's something that could provide value. And even if you fast forward to today, we're still um, uh, exploring and learning about how we can interface with the human body. What, what are the, the, the key metrics that could help inform physicians? And we've really uh, uh, invested a lot in healthcare in that way. Uh, it's not just a gadget that you wear to track your steps. It's a device that has um, a, a phone app that goes with it, uh, a cloud piece that could be communicated to caregivers. And building that whole symbiosis, the, the ecosystem, uh, builds more on top of that base hardware that we started out with in 2008, 2009. And that's essentially, you know, where the future is for MC10 and where we're going with it. So we're, we're so let's say, seven, eight years in. Um, how early are we still in, in this innovation cycle with where your vision really is? Um, mm-hmm. It seems like 
things have, have leapt forward considerably since 2008, 2009. Um, but it also seems at the same time that we're very, very early. We're here at the Wearable Tech and right. Digital Health Conference in, in mm -hmm. New York City. And, um, you know, it's mainly early adopters here, technologists, technology people. Um, where does this go? How early are we? Right. Yeah. So it's very easy to uh, just, you know, be uh, completely um, uh, enchanted by our own um, technology and sip on the Kool-Aid, so to speak. It's beyond these walls where you really need to make impact and progress because it's not just the, the top physicians in the world that you need to um, um, convince of the technology, but the payers. Um, physicians everywhere across who are doing procedures or monitoring patients using uh, what we would call conventional uh, approaches. And to be able to make uh, strides in those directions is, it takes time, it takes market adoption uh, for us to show data, clinical data, that this does um, uh, show impact over what what is uh, the gold standard that's out there. And even then, it's still a question of whether or not people will want to change what they've been doing for 30 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just uh, something that uh, sometimes it's a step function. It happens right away or, you know, it may take a long time. It's hard to predict. Our approach has been all along um, to uh, partner up with uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies, medical device companies that have already made strides in these uh, in this area. They have um, essentially a customer base that uh, depends on them for drugs, for um, devices that help improve their lives and movement disorders and cardiac uh, disease. Um, and, and so for us as a young company trying to make it out of the gates in this time where there's tremendous excitement, but it's just kind of all working itself out. That's the approach we're taking where we see benefit and we take a few bets with certain companies that we work with, but it really helps us and it hopefully helps them uh, introduce not just a pill, but a companion device that uh, could be used alongside their drugs. So mm -hmm. they, in essence, benefit by providing a service. It's not just uh, providing pills and not knowing, you know, how uh, the patients are responding. Are they even compliant? Um, so there, there's this uh, interesting synergy that we are hoping to uh, help mature and nurture further that for us as a young company was really critical to being able to uh, enter into this space. So what, what, um, what lessons learned? You're, you're a few years in into this company and things um, seem to be going really well. Um, I'm sure there have been a lot of challenges along the way and mm -hmm. probably many more to come. Just from a, a co-founder's perspective, what were some of the, the things that um, you've learned along this journey that you might share with your, your fellow entrepreneurs out there that maybe are just getting started, maybe they're in a lab somewhere mm -hmm. and haven't even started? Um, words of wisdom to share with them. Uh, so certainly the, the team that you assemble around uh, the, first of all, the co-founding team, um, but also the team, the first few hires um, were critical for us. We, um, we brought in some, um, not just technical minds, but also business and marketing folks who helped us kind of define this territory that we were targeting. Um, and it and took- Did you have a co-founder right, right from the start? Uh, we did. So uh, Professor John Rogers is, uh, is a technical co-founder. Uh, Benjamin Schlotka, he's our uh, business development um, minds. And then uh, Carmichael Roberts were the core team mm -hmm. uh, of folks who helped launch MC10. Um, and we had, you know, a number of folks who joined along the way who um, helped, you know, uh, bring us to the point where we knew what we wanted to go target and then, you know, go execute. Um, so the team for me, um, it's just, you know, you want to, find a group of folks who you learn from. It's not just people who um, are there to do a task, but you could feed off of their energy as well as their um, their um, their skill sets. So and it sounded like different disciplines. So some absolutely. focused on materials, some focused on bio. This is that's the new world order. It seems for uh, everything I've seen um, for MC10. You know, we have material science as a discipline. I bring in a lot of the the biomedical. Uh, sensor uh, expertise, and then we have folks from semiconductors, 
and uh, mechanical engineers and really it's not your, and it's because we're integrating this entire system. It's a hardware that goes with algorithms and software and it's pretty amazing to see all of it work together. It's never easy because you know you learn from the skills and um, weaknesses of each other. Um, but that was uh, for such a usually for software companies there may be you know a signal processing piece and a little bit more just app development. Here, when you have hardware integrated with everything else, uh, it just became clear that um, you know there are parts that. I, I wasn't the expert in. We needed to bring in folks who really were. And being in a place like Boston, um, you know, made that um, somewhat. Is the uh, entire team in Boston? Uh, Boston most Cambridge? of the team is in Boston. We have had uh, folks who have commuted um, from, you know, anywhere from Michigan all the way from California to fulfill certain roles. And we have strategic reasons why we want to be in California for a number of reasons. Um, but overall, it's um, mostly based in Boston. Uh, the majority of us are there. So we've got focus, focus on the team, also this concept of maybe cross-pollination of types of Definitely. skill sets and people. Um, other, other things that you guys nailed from the beginning or you feel like you learned along the way that, that really have helped you get to where you are? Uh, so we, we knew right away that there were a tremendous number of applications for the technology. Um, and that made it a blessing and a curse in a lot of ways. So, uh, you know, flexible circuits, you can essentially apply them to a lot of different places. We placed a, a concerted effort focus around healthcare. Um, that was uh, done strategically then um, in, you know, 2010, 2011 timeframe uh, based on what we, what we knew at the time to be a blossoming field, but also given you know, the, the cost to introduce new technology. So weighing in all of these different uh, things into the formula allowed us to quickly figure out where we wanted this technology to go. What is the identity of MC10? So there was an early focus that right. sounded like it was pretty critical. And it, it took a little while for us to get there, but we, we learned from stumbling around uh, and talking to different partners that healthcare was the place we wanted to go to. Um, mm -hmm. Even with consumer health, it's always a fine line between healthcare and regulated and devices that you know are more consumer health oriented. But all along, it's always been, I could sum it up as bio-integrated devices. So they're devices that you wear on your skin or even uh, in the future can uh, plant, uh, laminate onto your organs um, and be able to monitor and track things that you couldn't do uh, uh, the same level of resolution that we could achieve with our circuits and so sensors. So take, take us into the future, or maybe near future or distant mm -hmm. future. Where does this go in practical terms? How will our lives change because of the types of technologies that, that we're, you're building and, and we're talking about here? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So for us, uh, we see a future where um, we like to bridge the gap between uh, the way patient symptoms and chronic uh, diseases are managed today. Today, it's very low tech in the sense that you go visit the physician, come back in three to six months, and you know you no go data see them. In between. There's not much data, and if there is, it's a diary or it's very uh, intermittent. And usually, you go in if you're a patient. Physician asks you, "How are you doing?" You say, "You're okay." <laughs> or I'm not feeling so good. And you know, how do you base um, uh, essentially therapy based on such you know, minuscule data points? Um, so with the advent of you know, the telecommunications revolution, with smartphones being everywhere, I mean, you see it in this conference, you see it at every other conference you go to, we have this PDA device that has more power than most computers did <laughs> in right. the 90s and Certainly, uh, the, the computing capability to be able to uh, unlock a lot of data. So data, well, that sounds interesting, but what, what are we going to do with data? For us, it became clear that um, if we're able to uh, somehow combine our monitoring scheme with specific therapies, then we can, with pharmaceutical and medical device companies, target specific problems that they're facing. So if 
you go after a movement disorder patient who has tremor. Um, what are the problems? Well, they take their drugs, some, some of them don't, up to 10 to 50% of patients end up not being compliant in some way, shape, or form. Well, you could start to track that. Not only can you track it, but you could track it much more continuously such that we shift away from this paradigm where you just assign a dosage to a patient and they go home. This is all very dynamic. Your body is dynamic. It changes with time. And it's also time. personalized. Personal in the sense that I may have other comorbidities and you know maybe this medication helps my tremor, but it hurts my heart rate and that may cause... The interconnections between right. everything. Right. And we're seeing that at this conference where there's, you know, if you stimulate a nerve here, you're potentially going to cause changes in sleep. Changes in sleep could affect your heart rate. There's a lot of interconnections going on here, and we're just starting to see what that data starts to look like for specific diseases. And for a small company, we had to you know, look at specific diseases such that we could find an answer, get clinical validation, and, and then you know go on to the next disease and so on and so forth. Um, for us as a company, that, that was crystal clear you know, uh, up until last year when we uh, teamed up with UCB Pharmaceuticals uh, to run clinical trials around movement disorders and neurological diseases. We couldn't just go out and you know, do everything. So where do we start? And uh, I think that's kind of where we see the future going. Um, having companion devices to help your drug regimens or even your implantable devices, how they're um, How soon do, are we to implantables? Uh, so, or is there more of a regulatory so, thing than a technology? Absolutely. So, I, when I said implantable, I was referring to a, a wearable device that could be used to help tune how your implantable device is uh, is behaving. Is it is it stimulating at the and right? not just something like a heart uh, um, a pacemaker, but maybe something that's more widely used. Right. So, uh, so pacemakers, uh, deep brain stimulation devices that are used for Parkinson's patients. Uh, there's a number of. But different is there a point where just me as an everyday consumer, maybe I don't need a pacemaker, but I'm monitoring these things predictively mm -hmm. uh, or proactively over many, many years or decades? Right. Yeah. So today we're at a point where we're on the skin, and we could help uh, help potentially. Uh, monitor how your drug is um, performing or how your neuromodulation implant is doing. The future, we do see a, a path where you could imagine an array of stretchable sensors that could be placed uh, on organs to monitor and maybe even dissolve away over time. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's publications that us, along with University of Illinois, uh, our, our uh, collaborators are working on in this area that are you know, essentially showing proof of concept today. But five, 10 years from now, uh, we, we could see a world where we've, uh, in a way, um, shown that these devices on the skin could help provide meaningful feedback, meaningful data for drugs as well as implantable devices that already exist, such as pacemakers or others. Um, but ultimately, so maybe within ten years, we'll yeah. I we'll think we're we're at this. a point where you know there's um, the the regulatory and the the biocompatibility issues are are the next frontier to be able to uh, develop for this technology to be implanted and used in the body. And, and for where we are today, it's really on on the skin, right. as you mentioned, things like in band aids, patches, tattoos. Mm -hmm. um, how you know what does this mean for the average? person out there? Uh, so a lot of uh, the, the disease cases that we're going after right now in movement disorder, it's not just when you take your drugs that we're interested in. We, as pharmaceutical industry, healthcare worldwide, are also interested in your quality of life. Uh, how are you living your life after you take this medication? Is it, right. is it improving? Is it, are you sleeping better? And that's where, uh, although we're starting at the, the, the point where we're looking at specific diseases to get that validation, to show that we can build devices that actually um, have meaningful data streaming off, that's uh, the next uh, uh, area of focus. It's you can not only track when you're taking certain meds, but what if you actually track how they're doing after they've taken their meds over the next year? And mm. 
start to glean new data streams that um, tell you whether or not quality of life is getting better. And really connected to real outcomes. Right, absolutely. And the outcomes, and everyone's ultimately interested in that. How, how well are people doing outside? It's not just you know, when they come to the physician's office, it's when they're at home, how are they doing? Um, how are they sleeping? Are they getting off the couch? All of those things are gonna essentially um, follow this path of showing clinical validity and showing that um, you, know, you could hit specific metrics around movement disorders or cardiac uh, disease. Fascinating. Uh, so I thought we'd do a quick speed round. Um, a few more questions here. Um, so do you have a favorite book that you recommend to other innovators, other entrepreneurs, maybe you give to your friends? Uh, so there's, uh, there's a few, uh, being in the Boston MIT area, there's a uh, uh, bunch of different um, books by um, folks who are in the MIT community. So, so you got to recommend their from, book. <laughs> well, they, the, that's what you're mainly um, seeing day to day. So political books by Noam Chomsky all the way uh, to Bill Olette, who's uh, done courses based around um, uh, entrepreneurship. And I highly recommend a lot of uh, the, the work coming out of um, the MIT um, um, ecosystem around entrepreneurship. It's, uh, it helped me just in the classes to build up that, that type of uh, understanding, but also this new world where you have open courseware. It's uh, Harvard, MIT, Berkeley, Stanford. Everyone's uh, really uh, embracing it. Um, and then uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell books are interesting. David Absolutely. and Goliath, uh, the, the underdog is always interesting to, uh, to kind of read the stories around how you make it out of um, uh, cases where, you know, luck is stacked against you. and a Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so who inspires you? You mentioned a couple of professors that sound like they were pretty instrumental, but through your life, who's, who's a big inspiration for you? Um, so my younger brother, um, uh, he, Saran Ghaffari, he's, uh, he's um, my, you know, essentially my inspiration throughout life. Uh, he's had uh, visual impairments uh, since uh, he was born uh, premature, and it was kind of uh, uh, something that you know I grew up with. Um, seeing how he was able to adapt and his vision uh, or lack of vision, uh, he became a um, person who depended a lot on his sense of touch as well as sense of hearing, and uh, that really you know drove me in a lot of ways to uh, doing research in in auditory neuroscience um, early on and. You know, one thing led to another. Auditory neuroscience. Uh, my research was all in micro scale, nanoscale engineering, which ultimately led me to um, the type of work I'm doing now with Professor John Rogers and uh, our team at MC10, um, where you know it wasn't. Uh, if, you know, rewind the tape, roll the tape all the way back. I mean, uh, I got into bioengineering and um, many years doing, before that. Yeah, really? it was yeah. really. High school, I knew I wanted to become some sort of uh, chemical or bioengineer, and um, you know everything from my college essays to grad school essays were all tied back to, you know, uh, me and my younger brother. So uh, mm -hmm. that was really the early stages, uh, the seeds, and um, and you know more present day folks at MC10, our CEO, as well as um, uh, my faculty mentors, John Rogers and Carmichael Roberts, have all been really instrumental. Wonderful. Um, how do you stay healthy? Uh, so it, being in the Boston area, what's uh, worked out well has been walking. So <laughs> there's uh, a lot of um, uh, just walking around the city for me, like being um, in, in a very walkable city. Um, that's, you know, usually how I've uh, managed to, you know, stay uh, active while I've been busy working. So I tend to commute by walking. Uh, that is uh, somewhat changed now that we've moved into a new office that requires, you know, other modes of transportation further away from where I live. Um, but that, that's, that was my main source. And then, you know, working out on the weekends or spare time. Um, Can't be but, walking. Um, yeah, but we uh, at MC10, we have quite a few uh, um, uh, healthy folks, spin instructors who are motivational for me. Anyways, uh, they're all, uh, pretty active and uh, the culture is such that we have a few people who are um, really into working out and that 
you know, uh, wears on me as well. Right? It's, it's very infectious. It's amazing. <laughs> so I wish we could talk forever. Um, I could easily talk for another hour here. Um, last question here. Do you have a favorite quote or maybe some words of wisdom uh, to share with other entrepreneurs, other innovators? Uh, so f- for me, it's uh, if I look back to 2008, which was a really pivotal year for me to just get started with, um, you know, um, looking, exploring startup uh, worlds. It's really a um, question of keeping your eyes open and seeking out uh, mentors and folks who you can really learn from. Uh, for me, I, you know, it wasn't just a, a startup in a garage. I really um, met the right folks who were tremendous mentors. They're, you know, they run faculty labs. They, they have um, laboratories where they have multiple students and Coming from academia, I was just drawn to uh, folks who had that sort of DNA. And um, being from that type of environment for me meant uh, taking whatever teachings that they had because they've gone through a lot of this stuff already in, in a previous life or in a previous company and learning to adapt quickly because you're going to run into similar things. Everything's circular. You see the same things. And I've noticed even at MC10, what we saw six years ago, things creep up again. And you really have to adapt and learn from the mistakes in order to kind of keep that slope positive because it's never going to be a perfect straight line. You're going to dip and there are going to be valleys, but being able to trend it upwards, that's the key. And it really, um, you you need to learn from those who've uh, kind of uh, stepped before you to make it happen. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for doing what you uh, do. It's great to uh, great to be here with you. Great, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Bye.